Welcome. It's our very last live panel discussion of the season, and it's also our last roundup. And we're going to be talking about the City of Lights. We're going to be talking about Paris um, and summing up some of our favourite shows and talking about some of the the exciting actions that we saw on the runway. I've also got an incredible set of panellists with me, a very large panel as well, which is sure to be nice and rowdy. But I'll let you guys introduce yourselves, starting with you, Alex. Um, I'm Alex Fiore. I'm the fashion editor of The Independent. And I'm Stephen Jones, and I'm a milliner. I'm Camilla Morton, and I'm a fashion writer. I'm Tallulah Harlick, and I'm an actress and fashion person. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Joanne Furness, and I'm a writer. Um, <laughs> I, re I write the reviews for style.com. And you Some actually of them. look amazing sat in your little <laughs> chair, <laughs> reclining. Yeah, I'm also it. really lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with a simple question to either one in. It is, well, I say it's a simple question, it's probably a tough one to choose because there were so many great shows this season, but what was everyone's standout from Paris? You can give me a couple, you don't have to nail it down to one. Stephen, what did you love? I mean, I have to say, the, the show that I worked on, it was amazing, it was the Vuitton show, because it was Mark's last show mm. in Paris, and so it was beautiful but poignant on so many levels too. He's just he's done an extraordinary job there. He turned it from an accessories house into a major fashion force, and I think also it was one of his best collections. Mm. I want to pick up on this a little bit more, but I'll, I'll <laughs> let everyone, what was everyone else's take on Vitam? Did everyone find it very moving? What was your thoughts on it, Joanne? Um, well, yeah, because I'd done some work with, with Mark as well, and he's incredible. And um, I mean, when you walked in, you went, all right, okay, what's going on here? And it was all of the past sets from the last few years all at once. And then it was quite funny because some woman tried to walk up the escalator. <laughs> so that was quite good. And then, um, and then it was, you know, kind of staging of a funeral, which was fantastic. I mean, and it was this, it was this kind of combination of things where it was quite sort of light-hearted in a certain way and sort of nonchalant with the clothes, but then quite epic and, and actually, you know, quite upsetting. So it was, oh, yeah. it was this bizarre combination of everything. It wasn't like sad, it was quite, whoa! Mm. And one of the inspirations was Cher. Mm. So. <laughs> I find it quite menacing, actually. Um, I think I sort of wrote something about the, the set reminding me of Mousetrap, which you said was yes. one of the first things you said. Mm -hmm. But in terms of it reflecting, and this is possibly me going far too deep into something, but reflecting kind of the fashion system and, and the the kind of mechanics of the fashion world, the fact that the models were going round such a convoluted set because mm. they they went round the fountain, up the lift, past the hotel, down the escalator, round the carousel, up, you know, it, it was that kind of thing. It was like, it was like Mousetrap, it was like they were trapped. The fashion world. Exactly, mm. exactly. And trapped, they had to go round the merry-go-round, you know, going through the motions. Mm -hmm. And I just found that very interesting as well. And maybe, that's reading too much into it. It was celebratory, but but there was something quite menacing. There was something dark, no oh, pun yeah. about it. Mm. Um, Stephen, I'm gonna grill you about this because you said to me on Wednesday, you said that you because obviously you did the beautiful headpieces and you you had quite a short time to create them. You were give, briefed relatively late, weren't you? And you said you didn't, you weren't aware that it was his last show. You kind of said, "We, I found out when you guys did." Yeah, I mean, Mark really kept it a secret. I don't know if his closest collaborators knew, but. I didn't know and we had a good idea, but we didn't know when he was going to move. And I, from what I understand, the LVMH gave out a press release actually during the show. Yeah. And um, Mark talked about it and Monsieur Arnaud talked about it immediately after the show. No, but I think in the, yes, all this was in the background, but you know, Mark really, and the clothes were incredibly embroidered. That's one of the great things. And I think Mark was really, really into that mm. this season. and into working with all the Parisian ateliers that he's worked with over the past 16 years mm. or whatever. And it's sort of a last chance to show how fabulous they were and how great they are with him. Mm. So it was celebratory in that point. Mm. I guess as well it's that idea of celebrating Paris as well. Yeah, it's it's sure. his last show in Paris and there were the, on a very superficial level, there were the sweaters with Paris embroidered, but then he, he did say in the show notes that it was about being kind of stunned by the surfaces of Paris and trying to celebrate the surface. And the, there was that idea, I think, of, of, I said, maybe I was looking into it too deeply because I think you weren't supposed to look into it deeply. It was about reveling. Surface level. It was about reveling in the surface. And he was sort of saying, don't read too much into this. Don't try and look for 
you know, don't try and look for a depth, don't try and look for kind of a darkness. Just connecting something on a superficial level. Yeah, yeah. but just enjoy it. And I think that's, you know, it, it, it's that idea of you can take fashion, you can overanalyze fashion. And I don't think to intellectualize fashion is necessarily to over intellectualize fashion. Um, but I do think there's, there's something to be said for a show that's just about celebrating kind of the frivolity and the, you know, mm. the coquettishness and it's this kind of, you know, very French bagatelle of something that's wonderful on the surface and don't try and look for something mm. deeper. Well, he dedicated, you know, to the showgirl and all of us. And I want to pick up on that idea a little bit as we kind of move through to talking about some of the other shows. And this idea of, you know, the show as a piece of theatre and where the models are showgirls and this narrative story, because we've talked a bit on that about this in some of our panels and how maybe that has definitely fallen out of favour and we don't see those kind of narrative shows anymore. Camilla, do you feel that? You know, everything's a bit off they go, 27 dresses, come back. Well, it is. It seems to be quite business-driven at the moment. It doesn't really have an, a narrative going on. I think the main... I mean, it's, the, it's, you know, it is where it is at the moment. And I think that, actually, I thought watching the Vuitton show, it was kind of a celebration of narrative shows and themes and performance and I think actually this show is almost a bit of a, a farewell to um, sort of show extravaganzas for mm -hmm. a while because mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. else do, you know who else does shows with that sort of much of a set or a drama or a distraction mm. I mean the the Chanel show is so clever this year with the but he he has clean catwalks and it's I think people have have stopped doing mise en scenes at the moment I mean but they, it, it's such a cyclic thing that it's sort of going away so it can come back at a different point. Mm -hmm. It's a, a different point in the, the butterfly's transformation. Mm. Strangely, though, I thought it was the return of the show this season. Did you? Yeah. Mm. Talk to me about yeah. that. Because I haven't physically yes. been out and around. Because especially Rick's show, which was oh, incredible. Yeah. And I don't think you can really convey what happened with Rick's show in the film or in the pictures. I mean, it was really incredible. And that had been worked on for months yeah. and months and months, and all the choreography and the clothing specifically for those girls and what they were doing. And it was brilliant. Yeah. I mean, it was really brilliant. Mm. And it was fun. And yeah. there was almost this kind of rebellion going on this season. A lot of designers were like, oh, fuck this. I'm not just doing this whole marketing thing. I'm actually a fashion designer. I want to do a fashion yeah. show. Mm. And it was, you know, so I think it's, it's coming oh, really? back in, you know, mm. especially when you have something like Com, where you were like, oh my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it was really this, for me, yeah, it was the almost the oh. kind of idea of it. This was the start of a big rebellion. Mm. And you know, oh, Mark's that's... show was the, the end of something, but the beginning of something, something. as well. Mm. And um, you know, that, and that's what's going on at the moment, I think. I think mm. you're, hopefully, because I like narrative, yeah. I like that experience and I really believe in the live experience of fashion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone talks about the internet and all that. But I like the live experience mm -hmm. and I wish it was opened up far more to the public. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it would that would be great. I think yeah. people go to fashion shows. Like people go and see sport then. Yeah, mm. you're really nodding to Lula. Do you do you agree? You're nodding. Yeah, to because it it, fee it feeds into the actress in me, and when I see, I know that I think Vuitton has the highest production level um, from what I hear of the models of how it's set for them versus other shows that are greatly dramatic and opulent, but that is run in such a high order specific way, uh, and I love it when. I love it when the models totally encompass a whole character and that it's, it's in every sensory, it's in everything around them and that, and, that, and they also it shows who were really, really great models and that's fun to watch and mm. that makes the clothes so much better mm. and so much more exciting and, and I completely agree with Joe. I think anybody who thinks that fashion's silly and foolish and it's not intelligent or dynamic. If they saw, if they went to a great show, they'd feel it and then they'd know. Mm. Talking about feeling it at the show, you mentioned Rick Owens, Joanna, I really mm -hmm. want to pick up on that. What was that like being there? Did you, because a lot of people have pe picked up on the kind of, like it's, it's obviously empowering, but how moving that was to be there and was well, it? I think it was, it was strange for me because he'd mentioned to me what he was going to do and I'd not talked to anybody about it. 
Um, so it wasn't like a massive surprise, but for a lot of people, this mm. is a massive surprise. Also, I know we're Koreans quite well. So, and I don't know whether people realize what Rick's really like and what he really likes and the, what he's into and things like that. So the whole thing might have been a surprise to people. Mm. Um, but it, it just had, I think when you feel that, how happy the girls were in the show and that it was this extraordinary thing for them to be part of this thing. You know, like a lot of the girls didn't have passports and, you know, mm. like everybody was was taken to Paris and, you know, all of this sort of, it was a massive thing. Mm. You know, and, he, and that's the thing about Rick Owens, he really looks after people very well, he's very human. Mm. And, um, and, but you felt there kind of like, whoa, we're in that's Paris true. and we're doing this in front of everybody, this thing that we just do. And everybody was like, wow. Do you think it forced people, we've talked a bit about this on the fatigue of Fashion Week on these panels and how often you can just see a show and you almost don't appreciate it. And I love <coughs> that you say you kind of shared in their joy and enthusiasm to be there. Because do you think it made everyone a bit more thankful to yes. be? Yes, yeah. I, I really think that. Mm. And especially like when you went backstage to see Rick and to see, you know, like panels with styling and, and, you, and you just, everybody was like, <laughs> like this it was quite that was quite moving it was quite sort of because everybody was a bit sort of teary and going oh my god we've done this and it was and i was like oh, i just want to stay here mm. <laughs> what was your take on it Alex? um i i really enjoyed it which is quite controversial for me because i absolutely hate anything that you fuses hate i hate fashion <laughs> fused with dance i hate <laughs> i hate contemporary <laughs> dance as an individual thing and i also hate especially hate any kind of fusion of fashion with dance uh -huh. which is irrespective of however great the designer I've forgotten is forgotten how much you hate I that i really hate it but i didn't hate this and that was kind of but i don't think it's that kind of contemporary dance when we're forced to watch contemporary dancing no in the land, i worried when they came what? out and they were banging their chests i was like oh is this <laughs> oh, are we, you know, but then no, I think you've got, and also the interesting thing is, I think there's very much been to talk about horrible trends, this idea of lots of people doing things around sportswear and sports looks mm. and that kind of bollocks that people talk about in fashion, but then this was, it was actually real, it was real clothes, real movement, mm -hmm. a real kind of sport, mm -hmm. and an alternative kind of sport, it wasn't mm -hmm. like someone, you know, running around or, or jumping hurdles or something crap like that, it, and there was a real <laughs> relevance in seeing those clothes in movements and the fact they're all wearing trainers and that, you know, there was something really interesting about seeing the clothes in that context and how perfectly the clothes worked in that context. Was this not about more than clothes though? I think this was about femininity and it was about women and it, I, I felt... That's like what Susie Menkes said. I mean, in her review, she was just talking about the exhilaration of being at the show and suddenly, you know, wow, there's another idea of beauty mm. and it wasn't just that standard thing being churned out again. And suddenly, it, fashion was is sort of embracing as opposed to exclusive mm. and it just felt like such a, a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But do we not worry that an element of this being such a show of the season, people being so shocked by it, rather than it, it signalling that fashion is becoming inclusive, it signals that you can kind of make a spectacle out of inclusivity but not make it consistent? No, because I think also the way that, that Rick has worked over the past few seasons is this you know he's explored different ideas yeah. of spectacle but the ideas that he's been exploring of spectacle are also about things that are elemental and things that are very human and things that are very applicable to to people you know anybody seeing a catwalk that sets on fire is going to have the same reaction whether you're kind of a jaded fashion editor or a four-year-old child. You, yeah. What Rick does actually appeals to everybody because you see it and you're blown away. You know, mm -hmm. at the menswear when he hoisted these, the, for the menswear <laughs> he hoisted <laughs> men up by the, you know, by their, their ankles. ankles. And those guys playing the drums. And on they that played into, and this band played until it passed <laughs> out. That was amazing, and to see, and I'm like, it doesn't matter who the hell you are to see. They that were in the Eurovision incredible. Song Contest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, he went. Yeah. Oh yeah, they were in the Eurovision Song Contest. They represented Estonia. Winnie Pooh. Winnie Pooh. Oh, Winnie Pooh. Winnie Pooh. Winnie Pooh. I Winnie Pooh. But you know, so I think there's that. It, it's that idea, which is is wonderful, and it's it's a spectacle in the way that Vuitton was a spectacle. Uh, but 
dealing with it in two very different ways I think mm -hmm. and also I think that's the great thing about Paris you can go there and you see these designers do things that are so emblematic of what they represent it's not about what their brand represents it's it's I think it's very personal that's really designers. interesting we're talking about that with because we did our Milan roundup this morning so my head's torn between Milan and Paris and we talked about how no fashion fashion that doesn't feel personal in that same way it feels like it's about the brands it doesn't feel like someone's poured themselves into it and I felt mm. like this season you know, for me, we, and again, this has come out of the panels, we talked about this being the season of surprise. And Joanne, you kind of hinted at that before when you talked about it being this kind of spirit of rebelliousness. And I love mm -hmm. that you said that because there were so many shocks this season. You know, Celine, I don't, I, I don't think many people were expecting that. Same with Givenchy. McQueen, I think, was a slight I think surprise. there's also this emotional connection with what, which is something that I said, I think, in London. There was, a, I felt a real emotional connection with a lot of the stuff in Paris. Um, I my one show of the season that I cried at, I cried at Essential Lion. Oh my because God. I thought it was <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I mean, did you just think it was amazing? I thought it was great, but I wouldn't have cried. I don't know why, it just got really good. <laughs> you just me. really tired, and no, you were like, it's all true. No, I, do, I it thought, oh my really God, I didn't me. mean to be much. Have you ever cried like at a show, It such a wonderful thing. No, I don't know. I felt a bit like, oh. But when <laughs> I, you know, when, when people used to say to me about the couture shows, and before I'd ever gone to one, and people would go, "Oh, I cried at that," and I think, "Oh, you idiot!" Should good fashion and make you cry though? Do you know what? The, with the couture though, it's so emotional because you can feel the work that people mm. have put yeah. into those clothes. You can literally feel this emotion coming from the clothes. It, you can't really describe it. It's mm -hmm. really weird, and you start going, "Because those those people, those women, have worked so hard, and you feel it." Mm. And that I don't think you really get. Very I think maybe that's actually about anything. her saying it was yeah. it touched mm. me because it was so him and it was mm. also this um, wonderful realization of, of what he wants to do yeah and you know I used to always cry at Galliano shows I was yeah I just cry quite a lot at fashion shows <laughs> but I cry at videos of fashion shows you know I get quite emotionally I don't cry at anything else I get very emotionally midnight invested tweeting. in it yes my midnight <laughs> tweeting of but yeah I because you know fashion it's it's kind of like that Rick Owens thing relates to everybody. I think fashion does relate to everybody. We all wear clothes. We can all have this, it's a human being wearing some clothes. We can all have a relationship yeah. to that. We can all, you know, whether it's, whether you're fearing for their life because they're going to fall off the shoes or, you know, or, or if there's something, like Joanne said, if it's about the work and about the effort that you can see has mm. gone into this. And I think it does touch you emotionally when it's really good. Whether it, and even I think if it makes you really angry, that's good. At least you're at least it's getting a reaction out of somebody. At least it's mm. not just looking at some frocks. Mm. I think no. this was a season where it was a kind of there was that that intention to kind of either provoke or to yeah. or to kind of you know, connect mm. in, in yeah. a sort of, a, in a really big way. I mean, that's what I felt. So it was almost people were going against what preconceived notions of themselves. Like yeah. Celine, Celine, very much yeah. Celine was and this. Then, and then just sort of like, it was, it was a really, it's a really weird season. Yeah. Mm. It's a really strange season. I think the word connection is so apt because uh, there was this something, it wasn't about shocking, it wasn't about Mm -hmm. You know, trying to make people sad or move people. I think this idea of connection, I find that really interesting, especially in the context of Celine. Talk to me about Celine. Tallulah, what were your thoughts on? Celine was my favourite. Because, um, I mean, I felt, being there, I felt quite challenged. I was really double taking with a lot of things and looking back and looking back. and mm -hmm. Because the way that the the runway was, you could kind of look around and mm. look back around and see things again and again. And I, I just, I want to be Phoebe's best mate. I think <laughs> she as a woman designing for women is something super clever and, and really cool. And I want to like wrap around stuff. I think there's a lot of things that I'm like, you know what, for a shoot, totally there, in it, mm. bam. And there are things that I will not do on a street or actually, or, or kill it on a red carpet. I know, mm. you know, cause it's too sad to me when that then gets blasted out in, in tabloids and that mm. print and that look. And I don't, it sort of, it stops it. And I don't like that. So mm. almost out of integrity for what it is, I would let it have <laughs> lots of lives in lots of different shoots and have lots mm. of different, people play with it and own it and you know roll it out in 10 years and be like look and that's <laughs> kind of great but there's tons but there is so much 
I mean, she's one of the people that, for a lot this season to me, this whole art thing is seen mm. to be mm. everywhere. everywhere yeah. Art, 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 references of artists. It's almost like that the art thing seemed or seems to just hold it, that's like the most, the elite thing that as a person you can own and you can go out and you can buy. Because fashion has got so clever at, at making shapes and cutting and selling at a lower price. And so almost, I don't know, I felt like there was a bit of grappling for the thing above fashion, which I'm not saying is always the thing above fashion, but sometimes I think art, can clip it and mm. be the the most esteemed thing. So was it about kind do. of individuality, you know, as, like aspirational dressing, but not luxury? Because there's a difference between kind of being aspirational and wanting luxury, I think, and this season felt smarter than luxury. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't, I didn't feel like there was, you know, couture seems to be a, a different thing to me. And this, you know, I didn't get taken into, ah, oh, this is like a couture piece of art that mm. I shall cherish forever and barely wear you know the, definitely something much more wearable mm -hmm. um i just have to get my head around prince which is like a i just it's a bit of a curveball <laughs> dun dun <laughs> yeah, dun yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to mark and we but but i mean it's it's just yeah, we on. dressed in mourning from a lot prince. of these things well a lot of these things aren't prince they're all, they're all kind of woven, of there's, there. yeah. and that's what I have to say about Selena. I also it think it's a very different experience to go and see it in the showroom or something like that. Yeah. It, not just at the show, but then to go and turn everything inside out and comprehend mm. what everything is. Mm. And that's sort of what really good fashion is, I think. It's, it's that urge to go and actually put it on. Because then you want to go put it on, you mm. want to, then you want to buy it, and then, you, you know, that's good business. Because the production of those garments is really mm. incredible. Yeah. You just, you are kind of like, wow. Mm. Like, this, this thing has done so well. And it's kind of, but for me, it was, it was quite a weird season, this, because I could see some of this starting to come through in the couture, particularly in Dior, mm. when they'd done the, the different sections, the sort of the Africa section, the kind of, and the Europe, the America, the, I think the, the Africa Asia section, endlessly, the yeah. Africa endlessly section has been looked at a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Rehashed and it's, by everybody. And it's mm -hmm. kind of, and it was, I thought the, the Dior Couture was tremendous, actually mm. the best thing he's, he's done there. I mean, I think it's really interesting how this thing of, you know, the say 10 years ago the idea was luxury and adding that word luxury to fashion mm. suddenly mm. made it relevant. Now art is added to the word of fashion to suddenly make it relevant. It's sort of slightly where do we go from here? And I think it was the Chanel show, Karl Lagerfeld really underlined that by you know doing a show all like based on art and mm. sort of rubbishing it all in a way. It was amazing. Um, uh, because absolutely, Raph's show, the Oak Couture show, had been copied, particularly in America. I mean, there were just identical garments yeah. coming down mm. the runway. So many runways, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> I couldn't quite believe it. And then that's why Mark's own show in New York was so shocking in a way. And, and I mm -hmm. know he really did that with Katie and Katie gave lots of her ideas because that was completely not what Raph does. Mm -hmm. And that's why it, it looked very, very Jobs different somewhere. and, and yeah. very challenging. Mm. Um, but I'd love to know where fashion goes from here, uh, and in particular where Raf goes from here as well. Mm. Well, I think that's. It'd be nice to talk about Dior. Yeah, yeah. let's talk about yeah. Dior. Yeah. Let's talk about what Raf's doing then, because you know, we've had a few seasons. You mentioned how much you love the couture, Joanne. T tell me a bit about his vision for Dior and what's so special about it. Well, I think it's. I've I've known Raf for quite a while, and. You know, and I kind of, I know that, you know, what's really sort of funny for me is that people kind of go, oh, he's the minimalist designer. He's not a minimalist designer. Never has been. It was, but he abides by codes. He's interested in codes. So when he inherited the whole Jill Sander thing, there's a certain code that goes with the house of Jill Sander. It was minimalism. But Raph, Raph's thing was much more this idea of youth culture in the street and this kind of idea of, you know, building your own world in this very strange way, according to these these codes, 
And so what I can see, especially with this, what he was doing for me with your, you know, that idea of repetition, that idea of the uniform, you know, and it was, it was Olivia Russo who said at the end of this show, especially when they all came out and they were all wearing these badges, he went, Raphson and Schoolboys in Dior. And that was like, kind of encapsulates it from mm. the beginning with the idea of the school uniform on schoolboys to these kind of women wearing these dresses. And it's, and it is this sort of thing where there's a lot more to come there. It's not just a, a rehashing of the codes of Christian Dior, it's, it's something else. It's kind of going, going beyond that, but it's being respectful of that as well. He's always respectful of those things. I mean, he loves the history of Dior, he loves, mm -hmm. you know, what the, and the, you know, and that's the thing, he's an incredible, Christian Dior was an incredible man. And he's, he also knows he inherited this place, which has had all of these incredible designers related to it, including John. So it's, you know, but he had to do something else. Mm. So it's kind of, um, and you know, and this was very much this idea of this kind of tribe of women and this almost futuristic thing and where they, where they were from and where they were going to. But, you know, it encompassed a lot with this one, really. Mm. Mm. Don't know whether that makes any sense. Mm. There you go. Stephen, <laughs> you've been involved with different aspects of Dior. Can yeah. You <coughs> on? Um, I mean, I think when we're looking at the images now of Dior, what's so fascinating is the set as well, how the set is, when, when he thinks about how a woman is, she is in a setting mm -hmm. as well. And, and it's the, the decoration on the body is almost in the background. Yeah. Uh, and if you look at the advertising, yes, it might be a plain brick wall, but then there's you know a corner of a chair or part of a line. And that's as an important as decorative element in that image as the button is. Mm. Um, I think that's a very interesting take on in it, how to get that detail into that garment. Um, but I think absolutely he's been there 18 months now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is, in, in a way, the very, very beginning. Um, but it's an incredibly public beginning as well. Yeah. So, and gearing oneself up for the world of Dior and 250 shops worldwide and billion pound turnover, it's a huge leap, mm. um, even for him, who's an incredibly professional designer, and you're also talking about the minimalism. I mean, minimalism was the brief at Jill Sander, and he knows how to work to a brief. Yeah. He's a very clever and experienced designer in that respect. So, you know, I'm looking forward to not only this season, but in five years' time and in yeah. ten years' time, because I think he really understands the technique and sort of almost in the third person can sort of stand away from it and see really Dior for what it is and his own design aesthetic for what it is and then play with that. Yeah. I think if you're almost if you're too involved, intimately involved, you can't see it as clearly. And he's mm. at that stage now where he's still a little bit apart from it and mm. can see really what's going out <coughs> on. And it's almost like planning a game of chess or something. He's mm. seeing what can happen in two years' time, what mm. can happen mm. in 18 months' time. When you said he can see Dior... Because... Sorry. I also <laughs> want to have to interrupt on this. It's very, very different when you're at a couture house to a Pret-a-Porter house. When you're at a Pret-a-Porter house, you have like two or basically two goes a year, or maybe you know two pre-collections and mm. crews or whatever. When you're a, at a couture house, you're doing four times a year and all those other collections. So you're continually producing new things. So actually, the cycle of invention that you have to produce is much, much more than a ready-to-wear designer. Mm. Mm. I want to talk about, you said that he can see what Dior is, um, and I think for the benefit of our viewers, I think Dior in a lot of people's minds, it's, it's complex to see what Dior is, because you know, Christian Dior wasn't actually there for very long, and then we have John Galliano, who a lot of people see his vision for Dior as being what Dior is. You know, I think it was you that made the point, if you Google Dior, you get more John Galliano images than you get Christian Dior. Was that you that told me that? Someone told me that. Um, yeah, because John was there for 16 years or whatever. And he was there for three. So, you know, and he was there in the happen. digital age. I think yeah. that's, you know, the, the whole point is there will there are more pictures yeah. of what Galliano did you know, than pictures of what Dior did. But does that not muddy when we say, you know, he can see what Dior is? What is Dior? I guess that's what I'm asking. I think Dior's a sort of vision of French, to most people in the world, as opposed to, you know, fashion people, in the West End in London, Dior is this vision of Parisian femininity, mm. which includes 
you know, a ball gown, pink, uh, flowers, as opposed to, you know, sportswear and nylon and something which might come from another city. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he's, he's playing with those things, but he loves them too. Mm. And it's all those take, takes on those great classics, which is what Mark Bowen did and what John did and, you know. Mm. So Camilla, you've got a long history with the House of Dior. What, what would you say Dior is? But it doesn't matter what we think Dior is, it's what they think Dior is and how they interpret it and how they see it. When you say they, do you mean the designer? Yeah, yeah, I mean because it's a relationship. Raph is in a relationship with Dior and, and that's how he, you know, what they, they build together. And it, you know, we can all see it and understand it from how, what we want to get out of it, but it's, he, you know, he has to go in there and, and you know, it's a jigsaw puzzle. You have to work out how you're going to put the pieces in, or it's like moving into a house. You have to work out where you're going to put your bits of furniture and how you're going to define it. But I think, I agree with Stephen. I mean, Dior is very about the savoir faire, and it's that Parisian woman. Um, and I think, I think fashion is so much more international nowadays, and it's so sort of easily accessible and it's so sort of like out on the internet that it's it's quite interesting to sort of have a I think Dior always seems quite a French brand it always seems mm -hmm. like you know it's it, although it's very international it, you feel like especially with the couture you feel like its heart is in Paris and it's got that certain Parisian edge to it mm. it's a quality I really think it became a symbol of something after the war, though, and that's why yeah. it's very precious in, in terms of that. It became a symbol French of history, of freedom. Of, but also, it became a, a symbol of Paris reclaiming fashion yeah. Yeah. after, Breaking you know, Claire McArdle and the Americans and all the, you know, the London couture, which was much smaller. But certainly in America, that re the ready to wear in America. Um, Claire McArdle, Charles James as well, there was this whole kind of host of people in America doing 7th Avenue couture mm -hmm. and you know everyone had sort of buggered off on the boat back mm. to New York and then Dior showed the new look and they all had to turn around at the harbour <laughs> and come back because fashion changed mm. and it was this amazing kind of and it, it was the start of this golden age of couture and of France reclaiming its place as, as the leader in fashion and also I think Dior is, is incredibly important to France because it's it's a massive industry, it's a, mm. it's a yeah. big house, it employs a lot of people. After mm. the war it employed a huge amount of people. It's a symbol mm. of France. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It was, um, oh sorry, oh, it, it, was that, it was that thing as well where, you know, now I'm always astounded by the skills that people have in Paris. You just kind of go, it can't exist anywhere else. But also, the Nazis tried to move the couture industry mm. to Germany. It didn't work. Mm. And it was, it, w it could only, only really exist in Paris. And that, I think, you know, coming straight after the war, it was such a big symbol of this is, this is freedom. And that's why there's such a, a huge amount of kind of emotion involved in Dior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it, it really is this sort of weird political thing that goes on and, and you know, and the whole idea of what happened during the Second World War and the French being slightly, like, ashamed. And it being really this, you know, what mm. can we do and staking a place in the world as well. That sounds like I'm going too deeply into it, but there well, it's, was, it's there the was very that weird dresses, things. You know, it's the house that dresses French presidents' wives. You but know, they tend to go to Dior to dress them mm -hmm. because it, it has those. It does. It isn't sullied by some of the stuff that you have with a house like Chanel. There is, you know, because of, of Coco Chanel's behaviour in the war, though there is that. Which is weird, and, but it does still persist. There and are still did. people alive that remember that kind of thing. And it did take a while for that mm. to kind of, well, yeah. she had to go and live in Switzerland. Yeah. But there was also this thing with, which I don't think a lot of people know, that Christian Dior's sister was in the French resistance, and she ended up at one of the, one of the big concentration mm. camps, one of the death camps, I think, but she escaped alive. And Miss Dior is named after okay. her. Because yeah. mm. it's when somebody walks in and goes, ah, oh, Miss Dior. And she's like this, really incredibly tough woman who escaped to death camp mm. and that sort of you know there's mm. there's a side to deal which is not all sort of flowers and ah. mm. there's a kind of a toughness there. and and in terms of his design as well there's that architect in terms of pattern 
mm. and it's really something quite serious mm. it's not all sort of light and fluffy and girly it's this like bang and you must see that reflected in this collection i suppose with that kind of the yeah i think the modernity that i think that's a very loose word that, mm -hmm. that raf brought were we impressed by this collection i this is my favorite collection he's done at dior because i liked it because it felt i felt like there was a lot of i liked it because i think it was a bit of a difficult collection it feels like it's it's very much about Raph finishing something and starting something new. It's about him moving more into what he's consolidated, what Dior represents, and now he's kind of making it into what he wants his Dior to represent. Mm -hmm. He showed those silver looks at the end, and for me that was like a full stop. It's like, so this is what I've done, mm -hmm. now we're moving on to the next. Mm -hmm. And I thought when you started to see things coming into this collection that he'd introduced in his men's where you know, like you said, the crests, which are, are kind of from his history, the words, that, that he's used in his dresses before. There were um, a series of dresses, which you can't see here, um, where the back had inserts of floral silk, which was something that reminded me of, of coats he did in his menswear mm -hmm. last spring and summer. The exactly. Yeah. Um, I just found it very interesting. And also I like, I was sat there thinking, oh, some people are really not gonna like this. It's a very brave thing to do. Mm -hmm. Because it, what it's really doing is saying, so I've done the beautiful dresses in the Dior tradition, and I'll show them all at the end, but this is kind of my proposal for the future. This is the way that I want to take it on. This is what I want to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, yeah, I just thought it was really clever. And I also thought there, was, there were wonderful things. It was, it was beautiful. I yeah. thought it was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. And also really clever to talk about flowers and, you know, Dior as, to go back to the history, when Dior started, he wanted to make women into flower women. Mm -hmm. Um, Corolla line, the new look was called the Corolla line, which was after mm -hmm. the Corolla of a flower. But then to do it in this way, which was a mix of real flowers and artificial flowers, mm -hmm. it reminded me of, of um, Arabores and this kind of poisonous. Do you remember in Arabores? It's like mm -hmm. he has the a, poison a garden. garden. Mm -hmm. He yeah. has a garden of real flowers that look fake and fake flowers that look real. And it, it just felt like it was this, it was a really kind of twisted take on that sort of tradition and on. And on the idea of florals for spring. Yeah, well, it was that idea of against nature. Yeah, There's exactly. something kind Wonderful. of. And there was something, one, I think it might be the dress on the left there, I'm not sure. There's one of the dresses that looked like it had, this is me overanalyzing the way that I do, mm -hmm. that looked like it had a kind of a DNA helix embroidered underneath the flowers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, which felt like a kind of a sarky comment on house DNA. Um, but to a client, it's just some beautiful embroidery. Mm. We can unpick it, we can intellectualise it. And Raph intellectualises it, but for a Dior customer, it's just something that's beautiful and that she wants to wear. And for a designer to be able to do both of those things, to satisfy both of those things, is incredibly clever. Yeah. So yeah, I was, I was sort of blown away by it. Steve, you're really itching to say it. something. <laughs> I, I just said that actually, you know, in the set, some of the flowers were real, some of them mm. were fake, but actually some of the real flowers were oversprayed with neon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like gilding the lily, yes, literally. Yeah. Literally yeah. gilding the lily. Talking of another design, we mentioned that this, you, you said, Alex, that this felt like Raph sort of putting his own vision for Dior, sort of more, more, um, more in, the, in the picture. Another designer who did that um, was Alexander Wang at Balenciaga. You know, a lot of people said that this felt like this was him much more confidently saying what he intends to do with the house. What was our take on, on Balenciaga? Alex, I'll start with you because you loved it, didn't you? <laughs> I, I didn't like it at all. Um, Why not? I think for me, I, I've had heated debates in various automobiles throughout Paris about this, um, which is this idea of wearability and the importance of wearability. And people arguing that, that this was wearable and that Balenciaga was always wearable under Balenciaga. Um, but at the same time, I feel Balenciaga was always wearable. Balenciaga showed a month to his clients a month before he showed yeah. to the press because he didn't want the press's view of the collection to influence what, what, the, what the clients bought. But at the same time, he always used his collections to push fashion forward and to do something new. He used the, it to introduce ideas that were kind of brave and that, that were revolutionary. And this didn't. Um, I think you can talk about shirking off the history of a house. I don't think a house's history should be an albatross around a designer's neck. They shouldn't feel compelled to, to follow in their footsteps. Like I said on, on in the London panel, 
Nicola Gasquier said he didn't look at the Balenciaga archives until yeah. about 2006 um, and was very conscious of, of not referencing them. But for me, there just wasn't enough here. It wasn't, it, it, it's not enough to do what you do at your own label and make it in really expensive fabrics. It's, it's not mm. enough. There's not enough design there. There wasn't enough that was new. Um, there were silhouettes here. The, the, the short silhouette in this actually was, it's something Alexander Wang did. It's something Nicola Gasquier did for spring 2012. The trousers with the little top was something Nicola Gasquier did in his last collection. It felt too referential, and that's been ripped off endlessly by other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It felt too referential of recent fashion, and it didn't show me something that was new and exciting. The bags were really good, and that's probably what he's been employed to do, is yeah. to do a really good bag that they can sell a lot of. But was I disappointed? Yes, because it's a house, because of its history, recent and in the distant past, it's a house that demands more from a designer and I as a journalist demand more from that designer. It's fine if you do it for yourself but you put a Balenciaga label on it and I expect a certain level of work and it didn't match up with my expectations. Like a teacher giving him his smackdown. Yeah. There was, a, there was a, a shirt in it that I thought was really nice. There's a shirt dress that looked really fresh. Didn't look new but it looked fresh. I liked that um, and I like the backs. What was it, the rest of? What, what do you think? <laughs> I'm, I'm very hard. I'll admit I'm very hard, but you know. What we do, I, I, I'm going to try and rock up somewhere <laughs> in a look <laughs> and see what you say. The thing is, is I get your point. I mean, I, think I wish he'd just done this for Wang because it really is his little sexy short short. Mm. He's, he does a little sexy short short, you know, for someone like Joan Smalls. Like, and he rocks it out and they look really good in it. There are lots of girls that are going to look good in this, but it's not, but you're Belen right. It's it, not about making girls look good, is it? Well, it's, it's not very revolutionary in the way that it should be if it has a Balenciaga label in it, which is what Alex is saying, and I mm. completely agree. But what, you know, how would you feel if I'm in one of these looks? How, how, how would you feel if I stand in front of you? You're just Does wearing, it just annoy you? The thing for me know. is you'd just be wearing some clothes and that's that's not what I want from it. I don't, mm. it do you not think I'm going to look good clothes? in it though and be like, whoa, well, that's cool. What's but that's that? fine, you can do that in your commercial collection. It's, but it, I know, mean, it's that yeah. weird thing of you know, fashion and shopping. Sometimes yeah, fashion yeah. and shopping are not the same fashion thing. Fashion and clothes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I felt the same with, with Eddie Slamana at Saint, Saint Laurent. Laurent. Pause. No. <laughs> yeah, don't. I'm going to save it up to who, last. Who, who styles this show? Who works on it with him? Do you know anyone? I don't actually know. Who does does I think what? Vanessa Trainer consults. Carl Templer's involved. Right. As well. Okay. But I don't know who actually styles the show. I think Jacob K styled the last I, show. I I completely agree. I think there are wearable clothes in it, and I think they'll look nice. And for me, I think it's really weird that it's styled like um, a Dior show. Why is it, why have they got the hair parted in the middle and the hair pulled scraped back with very clean skin? That looks like, you know, Dior Cruise from this season. I mean, I know there's actually very few looks that you can put together in hair and makeup, but I, it, it's weird that the house of Dior and Balenciaga have always sort of competed with each other mm. and embraced each mm. other. I mean, they knew e Balenciaga mm. and Dior knew each yeah. other, mm. but I would imagine at the, when you st start to go to a new house, you're tr really trying to create your own identity, mm. and this seems to be borrowing somebody else's identity. Mm. It's more the identity of Nicolas Chesquet, though. I mean, and that's my big problem with it. It's like there's all this big thing of going, oh, well, you know, it's going back to Christabel's archives. No, oh, it's going back to the archives of Nicolas Chesquet. Mm. Christabel Vaya, Nicolas. Yeah. Like these, the yeah. ruffle dresses there. I mean, we all know the collection those are from. Yeah. It's like you've just hacked six inches off the hem. But why and is that less legitimate for a designer to use the archive of another designer at, at the house than it is for them to use the founding designer? When it's the archive of a designer that's been th so recent and so influential across the rest of fashion, it smacks of copying. Mm. When, it's, when the, those are collections that are wheeled out by other designers and other designers rip them off and people rip these garments apart, that's, it's very different than referencing some old couture from 50 years ago. That, you know, also, I think it's, it's, 
it, when in itself it's a reflection of something from the past. It's that weird thing of Chinese whispers. Yeah. Why not go to the original source and find something new, new in it. from okay. that? Sure. But do you th are you saying then that in 50 years' time, actually, given Keskia is, is an equally important part of the history of the House of Balenciaga, it is fine for him to become part of, you know, we both hate this word, but part of those codes and for his work to then be. I think it's, it's really, for me, I really love it when houses can do that and when they can embrace it. I really like it when um, Frida mm -hmm. at Gucci can embrace what Tom Ford did. I think it, mm -hmm. her strongest collections That's are when she can thing. embrace that and do something of her own, but also acknowledging that that was an important part of the house's history. Mm. I think there's also this idea of distance, like if it's, if it's too close to now, if it Red, you know, if, if alarm bells ripped ring. it off, then you can't rip it off again. Yeah. Do you want some more champagne, Joanne? Yeah. Yeah, do it. <laughs> um, Anyone else want any champagne? Or? No. Um, it's, that, it's that thing though as well where, I, you know, I look at what Karl Lagerfeld does at Chanel. I mean, I love Karl Lagerfeld. I love what he does at Chanel. People always go to me, how is the Chanel style? I always go, it's great. It's always great. And that's an idea of a show. Always yeah. an idea of a show. Mm. With, you know, this incredible team of people, including your mother, who is wonderful. <laughs> and this, you know, and you have this sort of, you have this kind of idea of, um, of something, you know, he's, he's had this history to deal with. But there's so much of himself in there as well, and there's so uh, how to be yourself and how to not be yourself. Mm -hmm. Like he literally wrote the book in fashion with mm -hmm. this, and it's for me as well. The show, I just loved it. I mean, I really did love it. Why did you love it so much? Was it that irreverence to it? That kind of you said it was a piss take before Alex. No, I think the set was a piss take. I think the the, the thing that I loved was the clothes. Yeah. It wasn't really about. It was just like here's but some clothes walking yeah. in the But he also with sort of slight touches, but it wasn't. It didn't. The clothes weren't kind of the clothes were the too clothes complicated. Were great. They but were yeah, kind they were just of like beautiful clothes. Some of it reminded me of of things that he did in the nineties. That sort yeah. of up kind of whoa. There was a fuchsia, a tweed fuchsia jacket, and mm. and I was just. But it wasn't like the things that he did in the nineties. It was almost like he can reference himself with this. The thing. confidence of that self yeah. reference yeah. is yeah. so yeah. important. And there's just something so exuberant in the show too. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, I love fashion and I love life. And, and here's eighty girls or where you know. Here's like so many models, and mm. it is the scale is wonderful. Just this, you know, so oh, yeah. many models, so many looks, mm. so much art, so just so much of everything. And you're not going to love it all. There are going to be things that you think. Really? Well, I don't think he expects you to love it all no. either. I mean, that's it's that the, confidence, that insane confidence, and that to do that this. ability to just get these ideas out and to just. But to have so many as well. Yes, I, think, I know. Is He's just remarkable, un unbelievable. He's and you know he said something once as well where he was going. Oh, you know, you can't look back at something that was kind of 30 years ago, 40 years ago. You have to look back at something that was 100, 200 years ago because everybody's dead. <laughs> <laughs> and it is that. And you go, yeah, because it's that sort of thing where he has a great knowledge of history mm. and not just the history of fashion, of history. Mm. And that infuses everything that he does. And I'm sure he is a bit like that about the art world because I'm a bit like that about the art world where I go, you go to art events, you look at what people wear, you look at their terrible shoes. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's like theatre goers. Really? But. I'm like, are you the arbiters of global taste? I don't mm. think so. Not with those <laughs> shoes on. The theatre goers, do they have terrible shoes too? I gave a tweet when I was at the theatre on Monday night. It's like, people who are at theatres are the most unfuckable crowd ever. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you're right with the art world too. Yes, you go, they're either wearing everything all at once and you go, oh, please give me a break. Or oh, just sort of the shoes, just the shoes. You should start a consultancy where you advise art people on good shoes. You could shoes. call it just the shoes. Yeah, just the shoes. <laughs> sort your shoes out. I mean, this is something I learned very early on. It was like, I was, like, I was taught, oh, you've always got to wear good shoes. Mm. Not ones that made, you know, let your feet grow. I mean, they have to just yeah. good shoes. But um, it was quite funny one. So, so I was talking to Nucci and Prada about this and she went, you should go to one of the art fairs and just review the shoes, <laughs> not the art. And I went, this is a good idea. But yeah, nobody was having it. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Have you chatted to your mum about the show, Tallulah? Lots Because your mum is Amanda Harlick, because I was from and, yours. And I was there and at the studio and hanging out and watching it all and having Michelle Goubert being like, 
how exciting is this track that I'm going to play? And Carl having to listen to it a few times to really understand what the track was, the Jay-Z, Picasso, Baby track. Um, and it all, you know, it was super exciting. And lots of people know that Carl is very, he, he's, He's great because he's clever and he's an intellectual. And that's where someone like a designer like Carl is so incredible versus... I, Alex Wang, I don't think, has the smarts. He's not. His brain isn't historically interested. It's or not whizzing. Mm -hmm. It's not that. And that's where you get different types of designers. And, and Raf, to me, seems someone who, you know... It's not just about being academic, but... It's about having your eyes open. It's a curiosity, I think. Yeah, it's, exactly. that, it's, it's like what Joanne said, it's that idea also of, of knowing that fashion isn't just frocks. Mm -hmm. it's, about, it's about a wider cultural consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. about what's happening in the world, and that's why this frock is rightful mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. because, you know, this is what's happening. There's this revolution, mm -hmm. which sounds really trite to say, but really, it's, it, it, we all wear clothes. Yeah. It's something that influences everybody. Um, it's all interconnected. Yeah. And being think, able to comprehend that, I think, is, is what makes you a really great designer. That, and that's how you can really sum up an age. Mm. Do you oh, agree yeah. with that, Camilla? Because you've, obviously you work with John Galliani, he has that similar kind of passion for storytelling. And do you think that there's an element of having to have your eyes open to be a... Well, I think, like we were saying, I think when you reference something, you have to, you know, ha do proper research. You can't just go into Google and type in dress. You have to go and look <laughs> in books or watch people on the street, see how the fabric moves and see how it hangs and drapes. I think that you can do shortcut research or if you really know what you're doing or how you're cutting or, or draping it. I th one thing I was going to say from, a, from my layman's point of view was I thought I thought the hair and makeup was really interesting mm. in Paris this time. Yeah. Like the way that Dries had gold up the partings or the way that Chanel had this, the multicolored speckles in the eyes or, or Pat's makeup, uh, Givenchy. I mean, I have to say that I think, it, you know, like Pat McGrath or Sam or, or those people, are, you know, they're designers in their own right, the way they're chameleons and come in and do. And mm. I, for, I don't know why, but I was really... Like, oh yeah. I don't know why. I was really noticing the hair and the makeup oh, this time. Because everybody was just going for it, and that was like, uh, and everybody kind of gave them the yeah. sort of the the pass to go for it. Mm. Yeah, as there well, was real because, Tinder mm. at this t time. I mean, this, I actually strangely was talking to Sam McKnight about this. Oh really? I said good to her, Sam, and he was like, wigs. So many wigs. Did you see the photo? <laughs> of the hundreds of wigs. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was amazing. Nick showed me that. It was incredible. I mean, and, and it's really hard to get wigs right. Yeah. And yeah. it really works so well. And then Peter Phillips does the makeup for this, and Peter's incredible. Mm. And that's what I love about Chanel as well. They've always got an eye on people coming through. Because, of course, Peter Phillips made his name really through putting makeup on men, yeah. extreme makeup on men. And then he, you know, he occupies this really this great sort of position of honour doing these these Chanel shows for mm. women and um, and also you know was kind of in charge of the makeup thing but he's not sort of doing that now but it's it's really and I, I think it is understanding that historical sweep mm -hmm. and you know and what this means on a on a global scale I think Carl really understands that mm. and those you know over the past year the shows that he's done have really been about that I think he's done something incredible shows over this past year. Come on, year. Stephen, you're popping there. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Stephen, the peacock killer. Thing, <laughs> peacock <laughs> killer, yeah. Yeah, thing, peacock killer. Thing is about history and research and everything. I mean, obviously, I work with John Fraser, and he is like the most researched, research. the yeah, most yeah. historical person in the world. However, when it came to a fitting, you know, you didn't look at the research because you just looked at the dress, and that was all that was important. Mm -hmm, and, yeah. you know, whatever went before, then that was just the starting block, really, for everything else that followed. And that's the great thing about Carla as well, because it is just about the dress. And does that dress work? It doesn't actually matter. He well, leaves I'm the history behind. Oh that's yeah, the genius it's all about, about now. Yeah. He's yeah. really good at capturing now. He might, he understands the lessons of history. He understands what Chanel means in terms of history and ideas of gender and kind of equality and all mm -hmm. of that things and how revolutionary it is. But it's all about now. He lives in the present, mm. and you know, and I think that's quite fantastic. I love Carl Agfa. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me, Joanne, when Carl retires, who's going to take over at Chanel? Good question. That was I, I don't. I don't want to think about that. 
I my cause... mum. <laughs> <laughs> she did a fantastic job. Yeah. Mm. Talking about a collection that wasn't all about now, <laughs> let's discuss Saint Laurent. So, Alex. <laughs> I would like to hear other people's take on it. Before no, I want you to go first because I think it's no. going to get us in the mood. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, my issue with Saint Laurent was originated with the show notes. In the show notes, Eddie Sleman stated that the artwork came from um, the, the foundation, that, which is the foundation that Pierre Berger and Yves Saint Laurent set up, where they do museum exhibitions of Yves Saint Laurent's work. So he stated that he'd been into the archive and had looked and he'd pulled out, certainly the artwork is what he said, which, mm. which presumably is the prints and the sequin things, but also there are real echoes of Saint Laurent House style in this. Yeah. In the past, the press office specifically have, have kind of made these tenuous links between what Eddie is doing and, and Yves Saint Laurent's past. For instance, they, they linked the last women's collection a great deal with, the, um, with Yves Saint Laurent's 1971 collection, yeah. which was based on, on, actually harking back to what we talked about Student with Dior. Yeah. No, it's based on, um, what Yves Saint Laurent's mother wore, okay. um, but more specifically it was based on what women wore in Paris during the war and mm. the clothes that he came out with, a lot of people said looked like the clothes that sort of the Nazis French tarts used to wear. Mm -hmm. It was the, And it was called Vichy Chic after the Vichy government, um, or that was the name it was given. Um, and it caused an incredible furore, he was criticised by everybody. He stopped showing Couture to the press for a year I think after that, he said Couture was dead. Um, and they compared what Eddie did last season to that. Um, this season was much more based in those codes of Saint Laurent. So you had you have the lips, you have the sequin yeah. dresses, you have the leopard print, you have leather, you have the tuxedo, you have the transparent blouse, you have all these echoes from Saint Laurent past. But I don't feel it adds up to Saint Laurent. I think it looked cheap. I think it was a rape of the Saint Laurent archive. It was really, I found it very disrespectful because it felt like somebody had blundered through the archive with kind of no respect whatsoever for, for what, what Yves Saint Laurent stood for. Mm -hmm. That's how it felt to me. And I mean, I overanalyzed it and carried on thinking about it and, and thought actually a bit about what Carl used to do at Chanel, which, which again, he was quite, at the start, was quite disrespectful. He said that he, you know, it, it needed a shock treatment to jump mm -hmm. Chanel into, into, the, um, into the 20th century at that point because it had been dormant. But I don't think Saint Laurent needs that. Saint Laurent is think, relevant. Oh yeah, because it was never dormant. That's exactly. the thing. And it's, it's, it's the foundation of what women wear today it comes from Yves Saint Laurent. So what was this about? What was the point? And also it really riled me that he took credit for the set design and credit for the styling and kind of left the credit for the clouds. I wonder who deserved credit for the clouds or blame for the clouds. I think she'd stand up and, and take responsibility. I just thought it was a travesty. Absolutely hated it. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> really, and I've been quite defensive of what he's done in the past. I've liked what he's done in the past at Saint Laurent, but I really, really didn't like this. And the Lorex socks offend me more than anything else. More than contemporary I dance and fashion? Possibly. <laughs> I think the problem is, is that when Saint Laurent created some of these looks originally, they were new and fresh. Mm. The problem is that they've become so much a language of fashion and particularly of like 80s fashion, like there was one little sort of zebra print skirt mm. with, yes. a with a leopard shoulder. print. Yeah. You know, I mean, it doesn't that's, say Saint Laurent. It really yeah. says Happy Hooker. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why I said it says Banana Rama. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> at, at, on Venice Beach. And um, yeah. you know, it was funny because we were at uh, Topshop a couple of days ago. And the fantastic thing about Topshop is, you know, you work all week and you get paid, and then you go out and you buy a fantastic top and then dance your tits off all night. And that's what these clothes looked like. Yeah. Mm. And then you throw it But a very expensive version. However, I do know that friends of mine who have bought Saint Laurent and are absolutely the adore are them because they're exquisitely made yeah. and absolutely comfortable. We had, um, when we did our Saint Laurent panel, we had um, Jack Tobin, who's head of private shopping at Matches, 
in and he was like it does just fly because people come and they touch it and he was like it is absolutely incredible but then I question why style a collection then to look really trashy if the pieces are incredible I just don't I don't get it mm -hmm. I find it really maybe it's like a big joke on all of us and he's like pissing us off so much that oh maybe no that's the point. I, don't, I don't think he is though. I mean the thing is I've seen some of it in the shops and gone no it's not special enough and then I've seen some of it and gone no, that's really done so well. I mean, you know, it's. I really like Hedy. I have a great belief in him. Actually, I think he's. I think he's really good. I don't think he's showing his best so far. Mm. So why? Yeah, which is so weird. And mm. you know, why is this? Why is this going on? And he really was one of the greatest designers of the past yeah. twenty years. What he did at Dior was extraordinary. And I don't know why. Is it the fact that it's Saint Laurent and it's the wrong label for him, or is it the fact that it's women's wear and he should mm. be doing? Oh I mean, no, I'd love no, to no! Know. He can do women's wear. I mean, it's this thing of like sometimes you know you don't, you shouldn't divide men's wear and women's wear too much. You've got to have the same head on and just do it. But yeah. I think there's also, you know, there's kind of, I can't really describe it. I mean, it's because I I really do think that. There's there's always going to be something there with him, and the, and it's a bit sort of dismissive with people, especially you know when everybody was going, who does this man think he is? It's like, well, this is one of the most important yeah. menswear designers who's ever existed. But then actually. Do, you, do you not think he's belittling himself a bit? Because I completely agree, and that's the, that's what I mean. With why style it to look like this? Because it's almost like he's inviting people to say it looks cheap, <laughs> and he is such an important designer. I just um, think it looks really provincial. That was also my, I, I think it looks like what kind of bad indie girls in the provinces wore. And also... That the, me when I was 17. Well, the music. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the, the fantastic thing about that it is, you know, Topshop in Maidenhead. Yeah. yeah, but the music Top was from 2001 <laughs> and I looked at it and thought, it actually looks like, I remember girls wearing this in but, 2000. It looks like Mark, from, Mark by Mark Jacobs from 2001. But I guess but we need to get to the book. Why is he doing that? Then? But what? it's also his language has been borrowed by the rest of fashion. So we're all kind of used to seeing his language done by all of these other things, done by these really kind of sort of lower middle brands as well particularly, they annex the language of Hedy Slimane from the menswear. So then when you see it again in right. something if, like Yves Saint Laurent, you go, ugh, oh, because it smacks designer, of the couples. Why is he moving forward then? I guess that's my question. Mm -hmm. But I, I, don't mind, I don't mind it so much in the menswear, but with this I think it is, it, it's maybe that there's the co-opting of Eddie's language and there's the co-opting of Saint Laurent language. And then combined means that it just feels like a rehash of everything you've seen for years. Mm. It just felt like kind of charity shop. Well, well, that, I do I say, think, sorry. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, uh, it must be quite hard to find your feet because Mr. Salomon and Pierre Berger always said that he was the anointed one to get the mm. gig. And he has the pressure of Pierre Berger who says, oh, well, remember when, remember when. He, he, he was the one that Eve had said, oh, well, you're great. And maybe he's just got overwhelmed by, you know, it's almost, it's almost like um, your hero has, has handed you the keys and Father Christmas has said, okay, now you're in charge of Christmas and you've just gone a bit I don't think he's mm -hmm. acting like someone who's overwhelmed, like no, putting no, yourself as no, a credit for the set. And as Alex no, said, there's no, incredible but, arrogance. But what I think is, but I think that, I think it might be coming across as a bit petulant, but I think it's such a huge job for him. And I think, you, you know, it does take a bit of time to get your feet under the table mm. and get into the groove of things. I mean, I, I remember when um, Ricardo started at Givenchy, that took a little while. Oh, yeah, to yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, I wish yeah. people would sort oh, of give him a, really cool. yeah, you know, cut him a bit collection. more slack. I Gold. really do. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I, agree, I agree with that, but I think what I, I'm not kind of, I don't really have an opinion on either way. I'm, I'm kind of undecided on it so far. I find it a bit weird. But I agree with what you're saying that people should cut him some slack and give him some time. And I'm a great believer in people being able to have a few seasons at the house before we say this isn't working. Mm. But he hasn't gone into the house and suggested that that's what he'd need. He's gone in and redone every store. I think you can. And he's changed. But I think that's what he that's what he was used to doing at Dior mm. Arm, you know, which was much more of a it blank was slate. When he went to yeah, yeah, I mean, like, had he did everything. I mean, he designed the swing tags. He designed yeah. the the yeah. the graphics were were her It's that it's that whole thing. He's used to building a brand, and there's kind of no one better at doing this yeah. whole kind of brand building thing and I think you know for me I can see why he changed something to Saint Laurent because then it's 
Saint Laurent Rive Gauche. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, exactly. But maybe it should have been called Saint Laurent Rive Gauche. Yeah. And that sort of, you know, bringing home the idea of ready to wear and the left bank and kind of rebellion mm. and, and all the rest of it. I don't think it was sort of, I don't think, well, I don't know what he was thinking. And to tell you the truth, I've never been invited to one of these shows. You know? No. And the whole so, business too. No. So yeah. I, in, in a certain way, I kind of can't comment about certain why things because I've seen you, the whole why thing. Why haven't you been invited? Don't know. Are you just not in Paris at that point? Or? I am. <laughs> and so you are, I don't know. Well, you're not going to well, invite yes. season. So you can have Alex's yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. No, no. But I just, um, um. you know, sometimes, sometimes it because I, mean, I go through the it. American pressing, and um, sometimes it's like too many people. And but, maybe they could make. But also because I, because I'm, people. Because I'm one of Raf's people. Yeah. But I mean, the yeah. other thing is, I, you know, to quant to quantify <laughs> the the sort of vitriol that I've piled on this. Well, I really, I really like loved the first women's wear collection. And I think that was very much in the in the vein of Saint Laurent. I think it was, but actually looking at the clothes, they were incredibly cut. Um, they made the models look incredibly tall and incredibly thin. I know they are, but it was the cut of the clothes that mm. accentuated that, and that's why it's it was so commercially successful as well. Mm. I thought there was a real beauty to it, and since then I, I don't really understand the direction it's gone in because this collection does link to the, the last one it links to the grunge mm. collection but but how do they link to that first collection i, I don't see there being a continuum don't you have a theory on this but you might not want to say it when we're live i'll say my, my theory <laughs> is that he genuinely loved that first collection and since then it's it has been slightly two fingers up because no one got what he was doing and he was like okay you think that was bad look at this um, but I think that's maybe a childish thing <laughs> for a designer to do but I don't think you, do. you know I, I just think it's did you like this Joanne when you look um, at it do you know what there's there's a weird thing this season where so many things I'm a bit like what <laughs> and I don't know it's it's the difference again between fashion and shopping mm. if I can see somebody's trying to make a point in a certain way I don't need to sort of like it personally and want to wear it I think it's that's like, my issue with this. I find it pointless. Mm. Yeah, because could, could you be impressed by this? Could this speak to you as fashion? It just movie? looks like NEC, you know, it's like show. Just, it's but the I Birmingham think, NEC. But I think show. as well, what's so important with him is the show and seeing the show and seeing the way the whole thing is worked I, out I because he's that, really like. I went I to his men's show the, the and it wasn't. Is, it was like. But I think the set is amazing and there's there's all this kind of stuff and then this comes yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. Mm. The set starts and you're like, this is great. And then it all comes out and you're and like, you're oh, no, that's mm. not. No. I know it's really hard. It's really hard because I, I do honestly think that he's really great. And I think that I'd like, you know, everyone to be a bit more like. But do you not think that's mm. why it's got everyone's back up so much? Because I, I, I personally feel like everyone does think he's great. And I think that's why people are so annoyed. If they just thought he was a crap designer, they just mm. ignore it. I think a lot mm -hmm. of women's wear journalists have no idea about how to really? and what he's yes, done. Yes, very true. Because most people, they've never it's been to a positive. men's wear show. That's it's yeah. it's ever, very weirdly ever, positive. Ever. The, the men's and women's wear worlds are weirdly positive. Oh yeah, and that's yeah. why you get these weird, nasty things. Who does he think he is? They've never come into contact with him. Yeah. They've never seen any of the men's wear shows. I've seen loads of those men's wear shows. I know yeah. how spectacularly good he he can be, mm. and that's it. You know, a lot of the, a lot of them are a bit like, oh, this yeah, is like not how we do things in yeah. women's wear. And you're just a bit like, oh, get a grip. <laughs> um, so it's you know, so that's why. I will kind of, in a certain ways, I always sort of will spring to his defense because I've come through menswear in so many ways, but yeah. I was always a women's wear person mm. as well. But it's so segregated. You cannot believe how mm. segregated mm. it is at times. There's only a few of us who do both. Do both, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the issue that he also had with that is people's expectations were so high and were so interested to see how he'd moved on and when he hadn't. Really, and, and maybe when that's just his, his aesthetic. His language had been be annexed by a lot of people. I don't think people's expectations were so high. I think people's expectations. Oh, people's expectations were insane. No, but I think they were distracted. High. People's expectations were all about this stupid Raf versus anything, which I know is a huge part of this whole conversation. But it, I, I don't feel. I actually really agree with Joanne. I think people's expectations were kind of bizarre and not really. They didn't come from a knowledge of of Saint Laurent and where that history comes from. They didn't come from a knowledge of Eddie Slimane and what he does. They came from this weird hype thing between him and Raf and. 
No, I'm, I mean people that know, knew his knew work. His My work, expectations yeah. were incredibly high to see how Is that why you feel so passionately that. against it then? I think as well it's, it's, you know, if I'm railing against Alexander Wang and what he's done at our house with an amazing heritage, I can't really not rail against this. It's, it's my gut reaction is that this doesn't feel like it's new and different and exciting. I don't feel excited by it. It doesn't feel kind of worthy of a, of a Paris mm-hmm. cow. But it's getting us all talking. Or worthy it's of got you this angry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel worthy. Yeah, no, that's part of his aim. I think, you know, everyone talks about it. So that's part of his aim achieved. But I, I want him to aim higher than that. He is one of the greatest menswear yeah. designers of, of the late, of the early 21st century. Not even the late 20th, mm-hmm. late 20th amazing. and early 21st. You know, what he did changed the way men look still and still exactly mm-hmm. i think and i, I think actually but i think the way that, that the interesting thing for me now is when you go to paris you see all these boys dressed as Saint Laurent yeah, boys they look mm-hmm. like dior boys you know bowl cut black leather jacket skinny they're going to work in banks you see them on the street oh yeah and that's part they're of all it, back yeah. straight away where did they go when he wasn't designing they were all on ebay looking for it presumably but they're all back out. It's that amazing cult thing. It's the thing that Rick mm-hmm. has as well. It's that cult, that tribe. But it's not translated to women's wear at all. I don't see a standalone girl. It's interesting, the most village. defensive people of it, I found, and this is speaking from just the, the journalists and friends I have in fashion, they're men who love him. Mm. I've met very few women's wear journalists, as you say, who are like, no, I love it, I'm that girl. Like, do, do you consider yourself that girl? Do you no. Like- <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> I know how mean he can cut a jacket and a pair of trousers, and I would really like it if he just sent down suits, suits, yeah, mm-hmm. thirty suits. look, 30, thirty suits. Because the suits right. in this are really good. That's yeah, why yeah. I always really thought really he should have done it first. The, the smoking, yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah, over exactly. and over and over and over again. I was like, why isn't he doing the smoking? Just do it better than anyone. Just like go, fuck you all. I'll just do the smoking. That's that bath dress, and the original was gorgeous. And yeah, I know, and that that was always my thing at first because I thought, oh, you know, and this is not talking to either of them about it. I was like, well, Dior, you have to re-establish the idea of the bar, and with Yves Saint Laurent, you have to establish this idea of the smoking. It's the the two symbols that stand for the house: the idea of it's this. It's almost idea those two poles of, of yeah, fashion ar- as well. Architectural of femininity fashion. and this idea of mm. sort of gender equality yeah. and kind mm. of revolution. And then I was a bit like, and, and laugh without any conversation. It was like, yeah, the bar. And then you get this, and then I was like, ah, oh, this is something you can do. This mm. is something that you know about so well. And tailoring, just yeah. tailoring. When, I mean, I, I love that idea that, you know, men's and women's wear is not that different. Exactly. There is an idea of gender equality. It's so weird with fashion journalism because you get a lot of people who go, women's wear people, oh, I don't write about men's wear. Mm. And men's wear people, oh, I don't do men- women's wear. And you go, it's like being a journalist who writes about design and not writing about tables, but writing about chairs. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. stupid. Yeah. And, um, you know, but you get that the whole I've time. I've had people say to me, if there's men's wear in a women's wear show, they don't look at the looks. Oh! Like, they don't yeah. really, And Style.com didn't used to put it on Style.com. No, no. They'd cut the worst thing out. is, yeah. if you have women's wear in a men's wear show, they are up. They get angry. Um, they get, they angry. get angry. I spoke to actually this in oh God, but I spoke to Dylan Jones after the Prada show, and he was like, "Why are there women in it?" I was like, from a, a newspaper off. journalist. I was like, women wear clothes. Oh, that's that's from a newspaper thing about Mark by Mark show. <laughs> The Mark by Mark shows, that it's was always the, the fantastic thing yeah. about them. It was mixed and it looked real. Yeah. I love those from shows. A point Maybe of that view. fixes all the scheduling problems. If all shows were mixed, the pace of fashion would be slow. I've cracked it. That would yeah. be so good. Yeah. Well, see, from a newspaper journalist point of view, I wrote about the Prada menswear show and then I looked at it in the paper and was like, of course they used a picture of a girl. Yeah, because but women's fashion, because fashion is for women. Well, yeah, yeah, but at the same yeah. time, we've you know? kind of we've gone beyond this. I mean, for me, Helmut Lang, my hero. Um, those shows, the mixture mm. of men's and women's wear, that's what it's about. It's about gender equality. That's for me it's such also an about important both thing. aesthetics informing each other. I think with Helmut, you had that men's wear informing women's wear, women's yeah. wear informing men's wear. But that's and that's Prada, more Prada, Prada than that, is really it? that. Prada yeah, exactly. has that. Yeah. She has that idea of gender equality. She has all of that stuff going on. So when somebody doesn't understand that, oh, why are or they. Or hasn't even looked at it, as yeah. often the case. Oh, go know what this designer's about. You know, you follow the men's wear, you see what happened in the last 
sort of, I suppose, over the last sort of 10 years, was that it used to be that women's wear would kind of lead men's wear and the season after you'd mm. get this sort of weird version of the women's wear in the men's wear. Then it started to be used yeah. as a laboratory for the women's wear. So you get this very extreme version of something yeah. mm. in the men's wear, off its head at times, especially in Prada. Mm. And then you'd get this other version for the for the women's wear. And she's incredibly, incredibly yeah. good at that. I do think you've got to say as well, from a very commercial point of view, you look at something like Burberry and you see the men's wear and then you see the women's wear and the women's wear echoes the men's wear and it's all going to sit really beautifully together in a shop. Yeah. Which is the same with quite a few, especially in Milan, yeah. you go and you yeah. see an echo of, of yeah. the men's wear in the women's wear two months later. And it's about, it's about that kind of cohesive vision of what you're saying, yeah. which, which is fine, but it's a very commercial And it's funny if well. you have seen most, because I used to do, I would do all the men's and then just the Milan women's, and you'd sit there and you'd feel so intelligent at the mm. women's show, because you'd be like, this is what's going to happen, and you'd expect it, and everyone around you would be like, so shocked by it. It didn't mm. always used to be like that, yeah. though. You'd have this sort of like, oh, God, what the hell's this? <laughs> um, but, you know, and I actually, when there used to be Mew Mew Men's Wear, I really miss the Mew Mew Men's Wear. It was really good. Yeah. I mean... And Fantastic. it's kind of best label ever. Yeah, mm. it was really great. Mm. And it's sort of you know, but there's always that problem about how do you negotiate the stores and how do you make the masculine and feminine. Mm. And and Mew Mew had this sort of weird hyper feminine thing to it, mm. yeah. especially sort of when this they changed the label color and it went it went into that hyper feminine thing. As yeah, well, and especially with this show where it was really like, yeah. it was quite insane this Mew Mew show, mm. but quite kind of brilliant it was almost poisoning the idea of Mew Mew as this mm. hyper feminine I loved her ha the hair on the lip gloss I trapped, know, it, yeah. trapped in this perpetual house but well. I didn't yeah. think it was a housewife I think no. it was like a little girl it, it was, was like, a little girl she, she was growing up and she got a bit more rebellious and she was trying to be really chic but her hair was stuck on her face I loved it it was it was brilliant what did you guys think of Mew Mew you know I, I agreed with you I thought it was really I like the way it was sort of mixing it in a little girl dress up way. Yeah. I love the hair and the lip gloss, but I think we should talk about Com. Yeah, let's talk, because uh, yeah. I'm conscious of time and there's so many shows. We haven't done Givenchy oh. properly yet, we haven't done Com, Lomba. Oh, and you no, reviewed Com, didn't just, you? Yeah, I did review Com. Yeah. You can't just skip over Muchu Prada though, it's like, <laughs> she's brilliant. Um, <laughs> and, and it's sort of, I don't know, I mean, I thought that, that strangely that idea of that idea of performance here, the way the set was, the way the you know really the sort fun. of wallpaper was with the this kind mm. of little girl thing and all the rest of it, you know, this was the most spectacular set that I'd ever had for Mimi in that mm. venue, mm. and it was it was kind of important in terms of that setting and this is a sick collection. Look, they're children's toys. When you say sick, do you mean kind of... Like, yeah. Yeah. Sick, good. There's like, yeah, they're children... Oh, yeah, always good. Well, they're children's <laughs> toys. And they were kind of wrinkled. At that yeah, point. and it was like, you know, there was a children's it's coat fetishy, scaled yeah. to a grown woman. Mm. I was going, oh, it's kinder whore. It's that, <coughs> it's that yeah. thing that Courtney Love yeah. used to do, kinder whore. And those are the little dresses you wear when you're like six and you have to yeah. go to your parents' anniversary party. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, it's really weird because that is a sort of a Mew Mew thing, but this yeah. is taken to the nth degree well, it reminded of me of like this. 90s especially the color combinations i think reminded me a lot of 90s Mew Mew and 90s prada those tights which was like 96 prada those crochet tights and the world's mm -hmm. ugliest shoes and the shoes again were hideously <laughs> ugly self-referential again yeah. she's yeah. got that confidence that she can go oh you know that thing i did then i'll kind of mm -hmm. just subvert yeah. it I'll just and kind I think of be a bit with like Prada. It's because everyone else is ripping it off so much. It's always yeah. interesting when mm -hmm. she turns and does it herself, does it herself and, yeah. and sort of shows everyone else up. I thought yeah. this was one of the most um, challenging collections of the season in terms of it was distasteful. It kind of made your skin go a bit. And I found that I don't know if it's just because we did a panel for it, and maybe it's because I looked at it. With, but there's something creepy about it. Yes, I love that. <laughs> it's great, though. There's always something creepy about Prada. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But, there's yeah. but properly creepy with this, it makes you a bit uncomfortable. You're yeah. Like, if, you have you seen the Damien Hirst handbags they've just done? No. That have real bugs in and then embroidered bugs on the outside. They've done like a limp, like it's like 10 handbags or something that have been auctioned. That's off. what's so great about her, that everybody goes, oh, that's nice, isn't it? You go, not really. No, it's yeah. got real, <laughs> real yeah. taxidermied bugs inside, like scarab beetles. It's really like sickening. Sick, yeah. So come on, tell me what. This is Con, right, like. Here we go. Yeah, let's talk this Con. Oh, God. This was really What did good. you say? I couldn't think of any clothes. 
she, yeah. yeah, like that was the thing that she didn't. Mm. She Did was like wanting to do problems. something now, mm. new, so she was like, well, um, decided not to do clothes this season. I was like, oh, all right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and coming to write about it was so weird because you go, well, how do you write about it then? So I decided to not write about any clothes, but to sort of start. And actually, I was talking to your mother and kind of going, fuck, what do you do? <laughs> and she was like, oh, but you have to have that response to it that's not the, and actually she was really good because she said, it's almost like you, you can't have the conventional response. And I was like, in a magazine, I know I could do that, like I could do something graphically, mm -hmm. so the words would be here and that there. You, you do style.com, it's like, it's a tool. It has to be like this. And then I thought, well, yeah, maybe I write a review that's not really a review. And it's just like, this is what it symbolizes, this collection, that you have to, you have to have this sort of leap of faith with it and go, okay, it's Ray Kawakubo. She's not just pissing about. This is, <laughs> this is somebody who, pink dress, yeah. mm. who knows what they're doing. And you have to kind of go with it a bit and what it stands for, for other people. Mm. So I'd kind of said, you know, when she does something like this, and I know this, that she has a symbolic significance, Ray Kawakubo, and other designers are so like respectful of her. And you mm. know, when they get tried to, they get trapped into these, especially when you want work for one of the big, big machines of fashion. You know, really, they want you to do shit handbags and mm. crap T-shirts. And you can go, she exists, fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> it's that fashion clothes thing that we've talked about quite mm -hmm. a bit in this. Yeah. It's the idea that this, it, I mean, these weren't even clothes. Mm. It was fashion. Mm. But, but it wasn't clothes. There was no but was it even nothing fashion? to say. I, 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 think I mean, this they is are clothes. Though. That's but I the think thing they've got. I think it is. Oh, they've got sleeves and they've got mm. armholes and they fit on the waist. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just. No, but she says it's not real. They're, 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 they're not real clothes. They're object. But they are fashion in a way. There are some things which, are, like for example, that one on the right with the pink tights. Mm. Yes, I can imagine it being worn. You know, it's not an Ellie Saab evening dress. Mm. It's a, the opposite pole, but yes, it's still fashion. Mm. It's still something that you put on your body. Mm. I think it's, but I think it, for me, it's that idea of moving it from, especially the the mechanism of the show, which was that raised catwalk, each piece having its own soundtrack, yeah. the light swinging. So it's like, so here's all the mechanism of the fashion show. Mm. No clothes. Mm -hmm. It's the mechanism of. So this is fashion. But at the end of the day, you can't get a product out of this. That's not it, what it this is about. about fashion, I think it's about, it was about ideas. It was about her trying to work something out. But it's it's fashion. But she articulated it as a fashion but show. Why, why she didn't it install it she, because of the machine around it. The machine is what mm. makes it fashion. And the point she seemed to be making is, but at the centre of this machine of fashion isn't aren't clothes that I'm going to sell. It's yeah. an idea. And here's the machine that it's it's an idea mm. for fashion. And it, this is the machine of fashion around it. That's what I thought, mm -hmm. at least. What did you think, Duran? Well, yeah, I kind of thought that as well, that it's, you know, it's somebody who's, who's kind of saying, well, what is fashion mm. to themselves? And it really is that thing that you have to have that kind of leap of faith with her and go, she is questioning this for herself. And, um, you know, so you go, well, what am I gonna do next? Mm. Um, and especially after last season where it was so, I mean it was insane in a different way because it was all pattern cut, so mm. all the embellishment was mm. actually cut within Into a pattern, the and you go, oh my god, how can you do that, you just go mad, yeah. but, um, so there, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say, Stephen? I think, it's a, I think for me also it's something about freedom, Yeah. Mm. it's just that freedom that i doing, you know, why should something have a collar on it? You know, why do we need to have a collar on something? Nobody needs to have a collar on anything. It's because a piece of fabric naturally falls like that on the side of somebody's neck. So this is as far away from that as she sort of can get. It's like, why do we have to, why does fashion have to exist within those terribly narrow ideas? Mm. And she's just trying to break them a little bit, make them a little bit broader. Mm -hmm. But it's funny, she's still playing with them. For example, that pink dress, you know, it's in pink, therefore yeah. it's that sort of feminine symbolic mm. colour. It's got ruffles on it, so, you know, it goes into the like, doll's clothes and then it's like, in a cage, so it's 
like a Barbie doll dress in a box. It's about presentation. Mm -hmm. And I think she's, I think some, I know that when she works and when she's working with her cutters, there are lots of different people producing ideas and she's there having some of the, so the ideas herself and also editing. And normally what will happen is that she will think of one, see one particular idea, which is hers or one of her teams, and then expand on that. It's almost as though she took everything from every cutter because they were all valid. And mm. what is a valid idea in fashion? I think mm. that's really what she's trying to examine. Mm. I think as well it's worth saying being there, I don't know if you felt this as well, it was a long show. It felt like mm -hmm. an endurance test. It was really, <laughs> because it was one outfit on the catwalk at one time. You had no idea how many you were going to see. You had yeah. no idea how long you'd been there. Which I think is also again fighting the system of, so everything's really fast because we all have to go to the next show. So seven minutes, you know, bang the outfits out. We'll look at them. We can look at them online if we're not seeing them there. You know, it's that kind of, but to, to kind of hold everyone hostage almost and <laughs> show us things that weren't clothes at a fashion show is absolutely genius. So in I the end, we've yeah. all got Stockholm Syndrome and we go, oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's been yeah, yeah. used to show 250 outfits in complete silence in the yeah. 50s. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think got off lightly. I'm conscious of time, but there is so much more that we could talk about. You know, we haven't really unpicked McQueen. We haven't really talked about London. We haven't... Yeah, we yeah I was going to say like Albert as well because he was really the chosen one at YSL mm. and, yeah. that, the women's and one. that whole thing with him is, I think he's really interesting with him, like mm. what's gone on over the last few seasons where he seems to have just kind of gone, oh, I'm just going to do what I want. Do you need to go, Oh, Stephen? do you need to go? <laughs> <laughs> but there's so go. much more I want to talk about, but... How would we sum up this season? We oh, and Junya, which I was know, great. Yeah. And Yoji. Yeah. Yoji's back, 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 back. Yoji's like the last back, two Junya's seasons. Great. And also, yeah, the, you know, like everybody's back. looking at the Japanese designers now, like yeah. Yoji, particularly yeah. in Isimiyaki. And honestly, I, that whole thing with the last two seasons of Yoji, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Really incredible. Yeah. And bratty and kind of fuck you as well. Like Everybody that's how, you can, that's how you can yeah, sort the season. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, how yeah you said the it, the fuck, fuck off collections. Perfect. Fuck you. <laughs> 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 oh, and Gareth as well. Oh, you know. there's, there's loads of stuff. It's Too really good. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, yeah Paris guys, was though. really good. We but in a horrible way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.